Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the QLOC panel discussion on disseminating research, open access publishing, academ uh, academic social networks, and institutional repositories. So, leading the discussion this afternoon, we have um, Elena Danilova from QLOC Research Support Working Party, Anthony Lay, and Narida Quartermass from the QLOC Copyright Practitioners Group. Uh, please use the chat or Q&A icons at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions that you may have for the panel. So I'll hand over to them. Thanks, Pauline. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on disseminating research in the world of open access publishing, academic social networks and institutional uh, repositories. As Pauline said, today will be a panel session. Uh, so we've come along armed to answer your questions. So please type them as Pauline indicated um, to the spaces for doing that. As you can see, we've got a presentation which is really to act as background slides for us to speak to and perhaps also to encourage um, your thoughts and questions so we can have um, a conversation. Uh, the questions that um, we've couched um, the presentation in that came from you um, were about publisher and copyright issues with the upload of articles to platforms such as ResearchGate, uh, the use of these platforms by academics for promoting their research, collaborating, disseminating scholarly articles, and advice focusing on the benefit of our institutional open access uh, repositories. So maybe to start off, I thought that we might highlight a fundamental difference between uh, institutional repositories and networking platforms. So that bullet point was just something that I wrote down, um, that really the institutional repository to me is just an extension of our library's traditional role um, in collecting, housing um, and so forth. And for me, um, as someone focused um, on copyright, is that implicit in these processes are pro or, or implicit in the, the repositories are processes which ensure copyright and publisher policy compliance. But Elena, I thought you might like to, to comment on that. Comment. Yes, well, um, whenever we are talking to the researchers, we actually say, well, in your institutional repository is your safe heaven because there are a lot of processes that are put in place for uh, research researchers, you know, for their convenience, um, especially when it comes to sharing uh, um, your research outcomes um, and, and um, yeah, meeting these copyright, um, copyright um, requirements and as well as actually uh, meeting the open access um, mandates, you know, complying with open access mandates. So these are uh, some things that we'll probably be discussing throughout um, this uh, session, so um, we'll touch on that a little bit more later on. Yeah. And, and Anthony, did you want to make any comment before we perhaps move to the next Not slide? except that if, if you find something on the institutional repository, you certainly don't need to check that it's copyright compliant. I, I think you can presume that it is. That's basically it. And generally the use would be for research and study. It'd be another used to maybe use it for a teaching purpose that would be it's not really that for that purpose i don't think would you agree with that Nerida? well i guess yes we can be open to all purposes but mm. or all activities but that's right it's primarily a dissemination of research um tool yeah. unless it's got a particular license on it you know yeah mm. there is also a growing uh understanding that you know, so research actually happens at the universities and if you are looking for some research outcomes, repositories are the best way uh, to discover those um, articles. So, um, so we have a lot of researchers who engage in the repository on the basis of that belief, um, which is true. And I mean, you know, it's um, the articles are well curated and taken care of and properly described and, and so on. So it's uh, obviously a really good advantage when it comes to dissemination and discoverability of research. So 
So if we just move to the copyright issues and Anthony just um, alluded to those when he talked about introduced um, the concept of licensing of the things that are in the repositories. Um, we just note that there are publisher um, and author copyright issues um, with the upload of articles to platforms such as Research uh, Gate. Uh, and my observation is that it's really about um, expectations on the uploader to manage um, copyright. The whole process requires good faith um, that um, any full text which is posted um, complies with author publisher agreements. Well, so, in fact, there is actually there is a, a little box that anyone uploading the file will have to take, and that is terms and conditions. And as as users, you know, we very often forget to read terms and conditions, which is one to proceed with, um, you know, uploading and that's it. So, but it, it very clearly states in ResearchGate anyway, that um, you have the right to share and upload and so on, uh, this information. So by ticking that box, a researcher actually agrees um, to these conditions and takes on the responsibility when it comes to copyright. Mm -hmm. And if we think back to the title of our presentation today, um, it, it referenced um, an, an article um, that I'd read, um, Publishers Push ResearchGate Harder in the Copyright Battle. And ResearchGate's response to all of these things is that they expect people to know yeah. that they have the right, that they, um, they are suggesting they are basically providing a neutral platform on which the uploader is expected to be responsible Absolutely. Um, for yeah. these things. Yeah. We had a, a conversation with uh, Elsevier uh, team, or, and in fact, it was a vice president of Elsevier. And we sort of mentioned that um, coalition for responsible sharing that was it's, it's a newly created, it's a relatively new movement. And um, a couple of really big publishers actually joined in the forces in order to have a look at what's happening in, in copyright um, on these kind of networking platforms. So um, instead of taking on the researchers and, and sending them their note to uh, put a publication down if it's outside of the copyright, so they actually reached out to the um, founders of ResearchGate and had a conversation with them. And as a result, they said, we are clear the owners are on the researchers because they do um, they, they are prompted you know that they need to have copyright um, you know so to, to, to be able to upload the article although they know that, that uh, a big part of the content which is on a research gate or on academia edu are in breach of copyright that's a publisher version which in many instances um, is not even allowed to be to be up uh, to be shared in any shape or form mm. Just and a, as, sorry, as you go first, Anthony. Well, just a couple of things here, um, if it's all right. One thing is to note that with um, with publisher agreements, often it'll be there'll be different uh, um, there'll be different conditions with ResearchGate as opposed to repository. So you might be able to put an, a post print on the repository after twelve months or twenty four months, but you might not be able to put it on the research gate at all or other particular repository. So there's actually a difference between what you're permitted to put there under the agreement. Um, and um, another comment is that research gate sometimes will trawl the internet and gather articles without your permission to sort of once you're in there it will suck up articles as well. Um, so they're sort of involved with the process as well. And, um, just to add to what you said with that um, also about the with the research gate and the issues with that group of publishers research gate I've read recently they actually at late last year they removed 1.7 million articles from their website so whilst they might say it's a, the um, it's a bit of cat and mouse game with um, who's responsible um, but at the end of the day they've got to do something because those publishers that uh, um, it's their uh, commercial um, property, you know. So there's a, it's, it's, it's a complicated issue really, isn't it? Um, I believe for the researchers, actually, there is a very pragmatic reason not to share um, any manuscript on 
as these collaborative networking platforms, even if it's their, their own version and even if it's outside of the embargo period. Because although we know ResearchGate um, has some sort of metrics around the publication and how people engaged with it, even to the point where they um, show the RG index or R index, something like that, that's not a credible um, metrics that you can actually put on your, say, grant application or something like that. And we do know that publishers collect information um, on clicks, shares, downloads, and other uh, information when it comes to, um, you know, when people engage with this content on the publisher platforms. So it's worthwhile either, we will be talking, I think, about it, so I'm not I'm running a little bit ahead of time, so I'll leave it for now. <laughs> And on the slide, we have identified some advice uh, yeah. that we would suggest um, uh, about, you know, checking publisher policies through Sherpa Romeo, um, alternatives to actually uploading full text um, to these platforms anyway, um, that if a researcher feels strongly that it's doing something to add to their profile, to their um, identification of networking and collaboration, then that's fine. Um, but this comes back to our suggestion that really, you know, upload to your institutional repository and then provide a link um, to that record um, in your um, platform profile. Uh, then things such as Ant Anthony has talked about, embargo periods and so forth, uh, are handled. Um, I did just put a note there with regard to actually open license content, that there still may be some restrictions um, with CC content, depending upon um, the conditions of the CC license that was applied. Um, and I identified that this largely might come down to the non-commercial clause. Um, and, uh, you know, it could be that the networking platforms um, would breach that clause anyway. Um, or that condition um, in terms of being able to upload something that had a CC but non-commercial condition attached to it. Okay, um, I just encourage you that if you've got any questions, um, please uh, let us know via the chat or Q&A so that, um, you know, we can talk this out or, or help um, with your understanding of these issues. Um, we also just thought from a copyright perspective um, that it's useful to identify what the purpose of the request a copy button is. Um, now, I think these are a feature of the social um, network platforms as well. Absolutely. And certainly they're built into our institutional repositories. Um, but the reason for the request a copy button is that that actually facilitates the one-to-one -one sharing between researchers of copies um, of their articles. Yeah. Um, um, and again, so I mean, uh, the advice for the researchers we would give is um, please be careful what version of the article you are sharing because potentially you can be in breach of the copyright um, because you, you never know um, who is uh, behind that request, let's put it this way. So, um, so just, just be mindful how you engage. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it has always been a tradition and a well-established practice that researchers were sharing that, you know, um, before the internet, it was probably like, you know, copies uh, of the articles. So um, now it's electronic versions of the articles, but just uh, engaging in that, you know, if you're responding to the um, request of, for the full-time article, just be careful what exactly you're sharing. And also the, the publishing agreements normally have that as a clause that you're free to share. Sometimes there's a restriction on the article, it's understood that it's, it's, it's not, it's a time honored practice that the publishers um, all agree to. So it's a great way of getting um, a, an article if you don't want to get it, if, if it's a pay, if it's an article behind a paywall, you can actually a great way of sourcing an article without having to pay the money by contacting the one of the authors directly and just asking for a copy. Yeah. Yeah. We thought this was a really um, interesting uh, table 
just again highlighting the difference um, perhaps in purpose and practice between um, institutional repositories and networking platforms. Um, this came from a really interesting article uh, called a social networking site is not an open access repository and the link is there on the slides which I think will be available to you. Um, so it's a good article but it speaks to um, some issues um, with the relationship between the researcher and the networking platform uh, and I think researchers pro probably would have lots of interesting anecdotal stories about things um, that happen um, out of out of the platform or perhaps unknowns to them but they get contacted by yeah, the we, platform and that's uh, really um, a contact is a contact and I always appreciate communication as a person you know working in the area but you know we we understand that a lot of these emails are not really true to the fact so they're not reaching out um, with good intention um, it's just a way of keeping that um, you know uh, connection between the researcher and the platform so uh, I'll give you a very simple example just we were experimenting uh, trying to understand how uh, academ academia um, or research gate works so um, we uploaded an absolutely blank paper and yet you know we keep receiving messages which where it says you know your paper has been downloaded this amount of times and you know people are engaging with this and so on it's just literally a, a word document which has no word inside it so it, it's not really a genuine communication it's that possibility to keep the researcher you know um, connected to the platform or um, for example, sometimes you receive messages from ResearchGate saying, oh, these uh, five new academics joined ResearchGate. And then when you, when you, if you happen to know that the names uh, in, listed in the email, you reach out and they say, no, I've been actually in, you know, with academia, you know, for five years already. So they have not just joined in. So that's quite an aggressive marketing technique from my perspective. And um, where academics are so busy, I think it just really um, pollutes, you know, the mailbox and takes their time. Having said that, again, thinking about this as a networking opportunity, there's uh, academia has, uh, I think, um, three plus million users or maybe even more. So there's a lot of people involved there. So it's an opportunity to look who is doing research in a similar area, get engaged, um, uh, look at what they are publishing, uh, possibly find collaboration like for um, jointly written research articles and so on. So it's a great place to be, but there are rules which you need to abide by. And if we just think about um, advice or understanding um, the open access requirements of our institutions. I think that um, that that last entry in the table um, is an, is a good one for us to just be aware, aware of that. Um, whereas our institutional OA repositories um, will fulfil the requirements of our university's OA policies, um, the commercial um, networking platforms um, won't. I might just. Um, share a question. So Tricia Kelly has asked, um, we certainly provide warnings, but are there any recent examples that we should highlight where researchers have actually been pursued or prosecuted uh, by publishers for breaching their agreements? Not really. I think, yeah. yeah so not, not that I'm aware of. The only thing I want to say, and that's a real example. So um, one of researchers reached out to us saying that while their publication was actually undergoing peer review process in actually an open access journal, you know, um, one of the possibly one of the refer referees uh, done the uh, text mining, text matching and uh, came across an abstract which that researcher just copied and pasted in academia in anticipation of the publication. Um, so they they came across that um, and, and, and basically there was a real possibility that um, a researcher would have jeopardized that publication because 
uh, if pub publisher reached out um, asking for the explanation because every researcher ticks that box that the content has not been published anywhere else. So the publishers are exclusive in um, uh, publishing the content. So uh, we had to engage our copyright lawyer, um, Tom Joyce, uh, to, and, and thankfully, again, academia was collecting that metric. So we were able to prove that there was not many downloads of that you know, um, or, or engagement. <coughs> well. So we managed to save uh, the publication for a researcher. So um, yes. we had a similar situation. I think it might have been on academia where academia had just picked up a preprint that was published. It might have been the um, a working version of something or something like that. They picked it up and uh, published it. And we had to, because of the pre-publication issue, the, the publisher wasn't asked for an explanation. I had to organise a takedown notice from that site. So there is a pre-publication issue that academics always have to, or researchers need to be careful of. I think with other things where if things are put up incorrectly, like on a repository, then normally the repository is contacted, a university repository, they're asked to have takedowns and that happens every so often. And of course, the publishers of group uh, work in um, trying to get these uh, large uh, sites like ResearchGate to take down publications en masse. Mm -hmm. mm. So the, the, the pre-publication issue is, is one thing to watch out for, I think. Yeah, and, and probably an issue um, which we would have more success um, communicating to a researcher in terms of the value of their reputation. Um, with their publisher. The one thing that I do know is that, and Anthony was just talking about the takedown notices. So it's, uh, I think that the current practice is takedown notices to the platforms. Uh, and of course they will respond, but just responding to those takedown notices isn't enough possibly to um, give the platforms immunity um, from the publishers pursuing them. Uh, legally, um, perhaps rather than that. Um. We had a difficulty once where um, a, a journal, an article was published illegally by a, a, a um, predatory publisher. And we, we, it was also on a, one of these platforms. It was on academia.com. We asked the platform to take it down and they, it, was, it, it proved very difficult to get it down because the, the author themselves hadn't posted it. So. And of course, at that stage, it's possible that if there have been downloads, then you, you've lost control yeah. uh, of that, that version. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we might just move along. Um, we wanted to provide um, a slide on perhaps um, point, pointing you to useful tools um, and resources um, for locating um, OA. Um, there are some discovery tools out there. Um, Anthony, I think you um, know a little bit about the ICANN has PDF. <laughs> um, did it's you want to add anything to what we've written there on the slide? The ICANN has PDF. Oh, I like the hashtag. Yeah. Yes, it's a hashtag you can write to. Um, and people also do it not just for journal articles, but also for book chapters and things like that. And it's, it, it goes through the uh, Twitter and uh, it's one way in which people can source uh, material, particularly if it's not on, um, say, on the OA button. Maybe um, it's, it might be, for example, a resource that hasn't been published electronically. So people can put out a sort of a, 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 a request. Yeah. And Elena, I think one of the other interesting ones was Dissem. Yeah. Um, th this is a very interesting platform, uh, although I do have my reservations for that, but I would encourage everyone to um, click on that link and, and, and check what they are. So basically they um, search for copies of the publication in a large collection of open repositories and um, they collect some metrics around you know, um, and, and I think they also pull information from Shoparomio uh, saying, you know, so when it can be made open access, what the embargo is and so on. So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, platform. 
Having said that, the reservation is, I've noticed in some instances, the um, open copy is actually pulled from ResearchGate or Academia, which are, uh, which in no way classify as repositories. And those copies may actually be in breach of copyright. So, um, so these kind of services in existence, researchers should probably be um, more actively engaged with institutional repositories. Again, they're safe heavens um, who will uh, curate um, the data, you know, so the data and metadata and provide direct links to the publisher and, and also um, ensure that the copy, if it's a green open access uh, version of it, will be um, open after the embargo is met. So, yeah, because uh, in a way, if you look for uh, a researcher name, that comes with um, a lot of information regarding the publications and whether or not they're open. So that is a French initiative, I think. Okay. All right. Well, we might um, just leave those resources for you to have a look at um, going on. And then we just wanted to add uh, something about open licenses. And this is a particular interest um, of, of mine as a member of the Creative Commons organization. Um, you know, we made the point before that even if something is open access in terms of its openness for reuse, that there might be some limitations depending on the conditions of the licenses. And I just wanted to put some links in there, really, not knowing what, you know, the questions you might be getting are, um, but to refer you to um, good resources um, for Creative Commons, obviously the Creative Commons website. Um, also, um, Creative Commons has created um, some frequently asked questions, which are asked by both creators of works who are going to license their works and for users who might be seeking to reuse something that's licensed. Um, and I've put references um, to those. The other thing um, as library staff members where we might be being asked to give people information in a training sort of um, environment, um, I've just highlighted um, a presentation which is actually one um, that I've uh, created and also a libguide which was created by someone else but they're both um, available under CC licenses. Um, you can see there that the perhaps mine's Australian and then the, um, the license is spelled with an S is a reference to the fact that it's North America but of course CC licenses are universal, um, international, so um, the, the material is relevant internationally. So perhaps those will be helpful, you know, in part of your storytelling um, and communicating about this topic um, with your community. It's interesting, it's actually surprising that how many researchers do not actually have a full understanding of how RCC license works and what it actually means for them, you know, how restrictive or how open it can be. So when it comes uh, for them to make a choice, um, they are you know, they seek for advice um, to, to, to better understand how it, um, you know, can benefit them um, and, and their work in particular. So they don't know which license to apply if they have a choice. <laughs> yeah, and the great advantage of the CC license too is that if you get, say, in comparison to say, maybe an article that's on um, even a university um, repository and that's been permitted to be there through the publishing agreement. Maybe it's a post print up there. It's able to be up there after 12 month embargo. That material up there, it's understood maybe it's, it's mainly for research and studies on the repository there, but a CC license allows a much broader use that can be used within the university for teaching purposes. So the scope of the use of that and the extent in which people can view it and academics can share it is just much broader. Um, so, um, they're just great licenses. It was interesting. We were looking at uh, a number of journals, a big number of journals, um, uh, looking at how to um, 
meet the open access mandate uh, for the researchers. And we've noticed that some journals actually, the APC, the article processing charge, will depend on the type of license that uh, a researcher chooses to apply for an article with um, the most uh, liberal ones, CC BY, being um, the most expensive one. So, um, and uh, yeah, so it's interesting, that connection correlation. And um, we've just got another question um, from Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Um, so Jackie has just um, put in a, a comment that we might like to discuss. Um, she says, I read about an example today where an apparently fictitious person has compiled a list of articles published in PLOS One, uh, removed the author's names and then claimed to be the owner of the work. This would be permitted within the CC BY license, but there is a serious ethical issue. Um, well, they're making a false claim of attribution, uh, which would breach the license, the CC license, and as well, it is a copyright infringement, uh, and it's, an, it's um, an infringement of the true author's moral rights. Um, it's just the list, when it, uh, I can ask a question here, uh, Nero, if it's got the list of the article, compiled list of articles, of, the, of articles published, is it just the names of the articles or this is the question around it? Uh, I'll see if the question. Add, we'll see if Jackie yeah, adds I have a today. feeling that that was actually compiled into a book and a person was, you know, claiming that, you know, being an editor of that book. Um, because if it was, if it was more than a, if it was a significant any any portion of it would need to be maybe the sometimes it's claimed that in the name of the article there may not be copyright in the, in, in the title because it's too short but anything substantial or any any amount you'd need to from both a copyright um, perspective you'd need to the full articles oh well, full articles well if this if they're in plus one they'd have a CC by license wouldn't they uh, Nerida? Yes, they would. And so under copyright law, you need to uh, reference under both the license and under copy under under license terms, you need to reference the creators of those articles. Yeah, um, I think the interesting thing is, you know, whether there's copyright in a list is one aspect in terms of substantiality. But if you assert yourself, even though this is a fictitious person, but on the face of it, if you assert yourself as being the owner of that work named, then, you know, I think moral rights probably. Um, breach of moral rights and breach of the license too, terms, and, yeah. And absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, Jackie came back and said, yes, it was the full articles um, com compiled as a book. So Elena mm -hmm. uh, did speak to that. Uh, Jackie, I hope that answers your um, question or your ask for a comment, yeah. Uh, now we've we've come to the end of um, you know what we had planned to talk about, and there are a few minutes left. So you know, please, if you've got questions or comments, um, that would be great. We leave it up to me to say, um, hopefully you found the session interesting and um, and useful, uh, and you know, given you some um, some thoughts on uh, how to um, interact uh, with researchers and and your community who might be asking these questions around um, the platforms. And if there isn't anything else, then. Uh, Oh, yes, there is. And Tricia, again, thank you. Um, what is the viewpoint when a researcher has more than one accepted version available by institutional repositories? For example, one while they were at QUT, and then if they move to another institution, one on that institution's repository. 
I think what it actually does, it, it increases the sort of dissemination, really. So because, you know, when, even if we are not talking about one or site, we are talking about collaborative uh, paper, we do encourage that people actually put it on um, their platforms when they go back to the repositories. Their repositories, I should say. Yeah, so um, it's not... So, so I mean, are we talking about the same version, but on two accepted, accepted repositories? Yeah, mm -hmm. so from, if I understood it correctly, so if we're talking about the accepted manuscript on several repositories, I think that only helps to sort of, um, to discover the paper discoverability. and, yeah, discoverability. And I don't think there's any issue with that from a copyright point of view, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've also got uh, a question from Crystal um, or a comment perhaps. Thank you for a great discussion. Um, will the presentation be sent to the participants? I think we'll just put it on the QLOC um, website, Crystal. Um, I'm interested in exploring the links. Absolutely. We'll make that available just on the QLOC uh, site. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, in that case, we might um, bring the meeting to a close and thanks very much for your attendance today. Personally, I'd like to thank uh, Elena and Anthony for their um, participation and thanks to Pauline and to Rachel for facilitating the work, the um, session this afternoon. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thanks.